Our next speaker is um, on um, the need for system scale models will be given by Jim Williams. Uh, Jim is a professor and the director of the Energy Systems Management Program at the University of San Francisco. The title of Jim's talk is The Role of Carbon Management in Reaching Net Zero, an Energy System Modeling Perspective. Over to you, Jim. Um, thank you, Sarah. And thank you all for um, coming today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the role of carbon management in reaching net zero from an energy systems uh, modeling perspective. Um, let me start with the uh, take home messages. I'll come back to these at the end. Um, but first, um, all foreseeable net zero, um, that is net zero carbon energy systems in the United States will require technological carbon capture, uh, by which I mean, I think the same thing as engineered and hybrid solutions, um, and therefore separate from the land CO2 sink. Um, second, that the types of carbon management require will depend mostly on the fuel strategies that are employed, and I will elaborate on that. And third, that the costs of different forms of carbon management can only be accurately calculated in the context of the whole energy system. And again, I will elaborate on that. So, um, uh, the work that my team and I have been doing for the last um, 15 years or so started uh, in California um, and included um, the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, um, which was um, a consortium of uh, energy researchers from the 16 highest emitting countries that produced um, a set of reports called Pathways to Deep Decarbonization for each of those 16 countries separately. Uh, and the target of both our earlier California work and the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project was meeting uh, a global two degree C goal. Of course, what happened in the meantime was the uh, emerging scientific consensus that uh, even two degrees uh, carried too many risks uh, to the climate and the earth system, and therefore that it would be very prudent to, uh, to, to try to keep warming below 1.5 degrees C in order to minimize climate risks. And um, of course, that was that that new um, consensus was largely catalyzed by the IPCC um, special report on global warming of 1.5 C. And and one of the key take-home messages there was that uh, remaining below a 1.5 C threshold would require reaching carbon neutrality globally by around 2050. And <clears throat> Rob, in his opening remarks, commented on the remaining carbon budget, um, uh, less than uh, 500 billion tons um, uh, that would be associated with, uh, with, with maintaining uh, temperatures below that threshold. And so um, our team took on a new um, set of research questions that were prompted by um, by the scientific findings and by the policy responses to them. Uh, is it technically feasible for the United States to reach net zero CO2 emissions from energy and industry by 2050? Um, that means not including non-CO2 GHG emissions and also not including um, the land, uh, the land uh, related emissions. Second, uh, what is the least cost pathway to net zero given current uh, cost uh, forecast and sensitivities around those? And then finally, what is the effect of limiting decarbonization options on cost and resource requirements? And that uh, work 
um, was published earlier this year in uh, the article that's shown here, Carbon Neutral Pathways for the United States in the, um, in the, in the journal AGU Advances, uh, which is uh, freely available for download at the URL that's shown on the right-hand side of this figure is an example of um, the supplementary material. So all the documentation of uh, additional results and methodology and so forth uh, and running to well over 100 pages is available in the supplementary material um, at that uh, website. Um, the energy modeling was done with two state-of-the-art tools developed by Evolved Energy Research. Uh, one is called Energy Pathways, which is uh, a highly detailed bottom-up energy system um, model and scenario analysis tool that uh, basically uh, divides the United States uh, up sectorally and geographically with a high level uh, of resolution in uh, energy end use and energy um, supply uh, equipments, uh, uh, equipment uh, in, in, um, uh, that are used for um, all forms of <clears throat> uh, 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 energy, energy supply and end use. Um, the second model is uh, RIO, which is an optimal capacity expansion model uh, that encompasses uh, electricity and also uh, fuels. And the integration of these um, is uh, very important for reasons that I'll explain. So um, this slide shows the uh, emissions uh, trajectory that was followed by all of our net zero cases. And so on the left-hand side, it shows annual CO2 for a reference case uh, based on the Department of Energy's annual energy outlook um, uh, and, and then um, uh, labeled central there is our uh, central scenario. And you can see the black heavy line that is a straight line path from um, uh, current year to uh, a net zero at 2050. And you'll see uh, at the 2050 time point, there are some remaining gross emissions in the system, and those are offset by uh, some negative emissions. And uh, the right hand pair of figures show um, the, uh, uh, the same. Um, uh, emissions constraint in the black lines um, uh, uh, from a cumulative perspective. Um, and it shows some more um, uh, detail on the composition of uh, where the emissions are coming from and what the source of negative emissions are, including primarily uh, sequestration in durable products and uh, to some extent, geologic sequestration. Um, the scenarios that were uh, explored in this study, uh, as I mentioned, a reference case based on the annual energy outlook, which is the Department of Energy's um, uh, long-term projection of population, GDP, and energy service demand. Um, uh, which was used in all scenarios except for one uh, that, um, that posited um, lower uh, energy service demand through high conservation. Um, the central case um, is uh, the one that was found to be the least cost pathway to uh, carbon neutrality. Again, all of these scenarios followed the same straight line path from 2020 to 2050. Um, then we did cost sensitivities uh, with high and low fossil fuel prices and technology costs. Um, and then a number of constrained cases as we uh, dubbed them uh, that were exploring the effects of different kinds of um, policy choices and social 
preferences around mitigation options. So uh, one case that limited um, the amount of biomass used and the amount of land available for uh, wind and solar um, uh, generation build out and also for the siting of transmission. Uh, one that explored the effect of delayed consumer adoption of electric technologies, such as electric uh, vehicles. So what if um, uh, consumer uptake isn't uh, uh, as rapid um, as one uh, might hope? Um, one uh, constrained the system to having no fossil uh, uh, fuel use whatsoever. Uh, even with um, uh, carbon capture and storage and no uh, nuclear. So a 100% renewable primary uh, energy case that the, those restrictions would, uh, would occur by 2050. In other words, no nuclear remaining by 2050, no fossil remaining by 2050. A high conservation case that I just alluded to, to uh, explore the effects of lower energy um, service demand. Um, and then um, uh, one uh, net negative emission scenario, that is to say that the energy and industrial system itself would be a source of net negative emissions. In this case, uh, negative 500 million tons of CO2 uh, in the year 2050. Um, and this was to follow a trajectory um, that was um, uh, consistent with trajectories in some of Jim Hansen's work on uh, returning uh, atmospheric concentration levels to um, 350 parts per million by the end of the 21st uh, of this century. So um, this um, shows two Sankey diagrams, which are uh, snapshots of energy flows um, in the United States. On the, uh, the left is um, the year 2020. Um, so that's basically our current um, uh, energy system. And on the right hand side was our central net zero case um, uh, in the year 2050. So this uh, contrast basically the current system with what uh, one version of a net zero system would look like. And so let me highlight some of the big changes. Um, in a Sankey diagram, the, the, the width of the lines is proportional to the energy flow. Um, and uh, in, in general, the way to look at a Sankey diagram is to see um, the primary energy inputs um, into the economy on the left-hand side, the transformation processes in the middle, and then uh, the end uses on the right-hand side. So uh, one thing that you can see is that despite population and economic growth, um, uh, by 2050, um, energy use um, is actually um, significantly lower than it is at present. And we will, in just a minute, uh, talk about uh, why, uh, what has to happen for that to be the case. The second thing uh, to note is that the uh, energy mix is greatly changed from, on the left-hand side, uh, about 85% of primary energy in the US currently coming from the three main fossil fuels, of coal, petroleum, natural gas, uh, to uh, one in which uh, the system is dominated by non-fossil. In this case, there is some fossil uh, residual uh, remaining, uh, about 15% of primary energy instead of 85%. And of course, that residual amount uh, implies something about the need for carbon management. Uh, another uh, obvious uh, contrast when you look at it is the scale of the difference in electricity uh, generation. Uh, so electricity generation is dramatically increased um, in uh, all um, net zero cases. Uh, so the, the um, 
uh, the physical logic underlying the transformations that are uh, represented in those Sankey diagrams are shown in these four pillars of a net zero or net negative energy system. So uh, first, um, uh, the decarbonization of electricity. So a 95% or more reduction in emissions intensity as uh, by 2050 is one of the uh, key benchmarks for such a system. Uh, energy efficiency. And so we saw uh, a 40% reduction in per capita final uh, energy demand, um, at, uh, uh, which helps to explain um, the, um, uh, the reduction in uh, primary and final energy that you saw in the Sankey diagram. Electrification, so a dramatic uh, increase in the share of energy coming from electricity um, from about 20% today to about 50% electricity in end use plus an additional approximately 10% of energy um, uh, that is coming from um, uh, from uh, electric fuels, or in other words, uh, electricity uh, being uh, used to produce fuels. And then finally, uh, what doesn't show up on the Sankey diagram, but is uh, a fourth pillar of a net, ne net zero, net negative system is carbon capture um, and the carbon management that's associated with that. And uh, you can see in this case, about 800 million tons per year of carbon capture uh, uh, was required to reach the net zero goal. Uh, notice I didn't say carbon capture and storage. It is uh, both utilization and geologic sequestration and in quite different proportions depending on the fuel strategies that are used. Uh, the way uh, in brief that um, these four um, strategies are implemented is through an infrastructure transformation. And so the sectors that are shown here, um, uh, electricity, um, on-road vehicles, and um, uh, uh, space and water heating um, are responsible for more than two-thirds of CO2 emissions from uh, energy and industry uh, in the United States. And what you can see um, is the um, sort of manifestation in uh, equipment stocks of, uh, of those, uh, of those, uh, of those uh, heat strategies. Uh, and so there's a dramatic growth in electricity capacity, um, uh, primarily uh, then uh, coming from uh, renewable sources. There's a dramatic growth uh, in battery uh, electric vehicles, both light duty and medium and heavy duty, and a dramatic uh, uh, increase in electric space and water heating, uh, primarily heat pumps, and also uh, electric resistance. Um, the, the economic consequences are shown in this slide here. So here's total annual um, uh, gross spending on energy um, uh, from uh, present out to 2050. On the left-hand side is the business as usual reference case. And on the right-hand side is the central um, net zero case. And so what you can see is um, uh, a dramatic reduction in spending on fossil fuels uh, and at the same time, a dramatic increase uh, in the spending on um, uh, low carbon supplies and also low carbon demand side equipment such as electric vehicles and heat pumps. Um, to delve into the sectoral details just a little bit, um, uh, here is uh, electricity generation on the left and capacity on the right. Um, and there's a, 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 a few steps um, that will be um, required in order to um, 
achieve the benchmarks that were alluded to earlier for uh, decarbonizing electricity while also expanding electricity generation to meet many new uh, electrified loads above and beyond existing uh, electricity loads. So first, a rapid transition from coal, which is the single biggest um, uh, potential source of CO2 emission reductions in the US over the next decade. Um, second, a rapid growth in uh, renewable generation, primarily um, solar and onshore wind. Uh, and then uh, a slower uh, decline in the energy provided by gas generation um, and the maintenance of existing uh, nuclear um, when it is safe um, and socially acceptable to do so. Again, this is the, this is the generation mix for our central case, the lowest cost case. Um, and if we look on the capacity side, um, the uh, other thing that is um, noteworthy is gas capacity being maintained for uh, reliability. And let me explain that. Uh, in the context of these daily profiles um, that were taken for um, uh, a state in the Northeast in our analysis. So um, if you look first at a high wind, low load day um, for a northeastern state that is dependent um, for its renewable sources primarily on offshore wind. So you can see the wind in the upper right hand, the wind in the blue, the solar uh, in the middle of the day in the yellow. Um, uh, and then uh, on the bottom right, then you can see um, uh, the uh, different forms of energy uh, consumption um, uh, that are associated with that um, output profile uh, on the upper right. And so um, the excess amount of uh, generation on that day is the pink uh, shown in renewable curtailment. Uh, so the Forms of consumption uh, include transmission, energy storage, flexible loads, bulk loads, and then large scale industrial um, flexible loads, in particular electric boilers and electrolysis. These become very important to the overall economics of a high renewables um, electricity system. Let's look at the low wind, high load day uh, on the left hand side. And what we see there is um, because uh, the wind is low, so you can see the blue area has uh, greatly diminished, um, that um, uh, the uh, once, once, once storage um, and uh, uh, the other available resources are, are used, then the way that uh, reliability is maintained in this system is the large dark gray area in the upper left hand side and that's um, uh, gas generation. And so the basic story that's illustrated by this figure is that the, the low carbon electricity system is dominated by renewables, at least 80% wind and solar across all the different scenarios that we looked at reliability is maintained by gas generation that is used less and less often as time goes on um, uh, uh, and uh, emissions constraints um, uh, limit how much can be used uh, and that the economics of the system um, are um, uh, largely uh, achieved through uh, demand side uh, measures such as large scale uh, industrial loads like electrolysis and dual fuel electric boilers. Um, that's the uh, gas generation component. Um, and so uh, this repeats that point that gas capacity is maintained at roughly the current side across all the cases that we looked at on the right hand side uh, what you see is gas capacity factors. So even though 
you retain gas in the system. Uh, it's not operating that often. And this is very relevant to one aspect of carbon management. Um, it's uh, in a high renewable system, um, uh, gas generation with carbon capture and storage is not economic um, uh, because the utilization factors for the thermal uh, components of the system will be very low. And so adding something with very high capital cost like uh, a CCS back in on a combined cycle or a combustion turbine really doesn't make uh, economic sense. Um, and so uh, it is um, more appropriate either to continue to use uh, natural gas for the relatively small number of hours in the year that are uh, uh, required for reliability's sake uh, or uh, or to use some uh, form of decarbonized fuel, which also is a carbon management question. Um, now, in terms of sort of a, a, a broad brush um, description of um, uh, what the decarbonization uh, strategies are, um, uh, the, 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 in the early years, um, of the next decade in particular, um, the opportunity for emissions reductions is largely in electricity and largely associated with the factors that I described earlier, the, the retirement of coal by, uh, by 2030 uh, and the, um, and the um, uh, rapid build out of renewables. And then, um, uh, later on in this 30 year time period, um, uh, reductions will be coming from two sources. One, um, the electrification of end uses. It takes a while for that, uh, for those reductions to be manifest because these are large um, uh, equipment stocks, so vehicles, um, heating and cooling equipment and buildings and so forth that have long um, uh, lifetimes. And so for that stock to turn over, um, even uh, if that process gets started very rapidly now, uh, if they're retired on uh, natural lifetimes, then it's going to take a while for the um, emissions reductions from replacing fossil fuel with low carbon electricity to be manifest. And the other uh, aspect that also uh, uh, will um, eventually um, uh, need to be realized is uh, for residual fuel uses, that those, uh, those fuels will also have to be uh, very low carbon, and that entails carbon management strategies. So basically, electricity in the short term and fuels in the long term. So there are three sources of fuels in a carbon neutral system. So about 50% of final energy demand in 2050 continues to be fuels. Now, of course, the total amount of final energy demand has decreased, as I mentioned, due to energy efficiency. And that includes the inherent energy thermodynamic efficiency of electrification, the superiority of electric drive trains over internal combustion, for example, no uh, Carnot limit to deal with. Uh, but of what remains about 50% is fuels and there can be three sources, basically. Uh, fuels that are derived from electricity, including hydrogen and hydrocarbon fuels synthesized that use uh, from, from the hydrogen that's produced by electrolysis on a carbon source. Second is fuels derived from biomass, uh, mostly indirectly produced through processes like gasification and pyrolysis and, and fisher tropes. Um, uh, uh, these are uh, designer fuels, basically uh, a new uh, generation of uh, biomass-based fuels, not corn ethanol. And then finally, uh, fuels that are derived from petroleum or natural gas using carbon capture, either in fuel production or offsetting of emissions. And one thing I should mention with regard to the 50% of final energy demand remaining fuels, that a lot of that remaining amount is for feedstocks. And unless we don't need 
um, hydrocarbon uh, feedstocks, then uh, there's going to have to be um, uh, sources of hydrocarbons, and these are the basic sources. Um, coming back to another set of psyche, uh, psyche diagrams, this, sort, uh, this illustrates um, uh, the scenarios that we looked at that had uh, uh, the highest and lowest residual fossil fuel use. So bookends, if you will, on the left side is the central case, but with a low fuel price sensitivity, uh, there is more petroleum and natural gas remaining in that case than in any others. And on the right-hand side, the 100% renewable primary energy case, which by definition had no uh, remaining fossil fuel in the system. So again, these are 2050 uh, snapshots. So let me show you um, the implications of that for carbon capture utilization and storage. So uh, in the 100% renewable primary energy case, um, carbon capture is still required. Um, and uh, that's illustrated um, in the highlighted uh, figure. Um, this is maybe a, a, a counterintuitive uh, outcome for some. Uh, why would you need um, carbon capture um, if you don't have fossil fuels in the system? But as I said earlier, if you have hydrocarbon demand, even if you don't have fossil fuels, you need to manage that CO2. And if there are limits on biomass, which was one of the assumptions of our study, that there's a sustainability limit to how much biomass can be used, then uh, then there's going to need to be carbon capture in order to provide um, the carbon input um, combined with uh, hydrogen from electrolysis um, to produce uh, gas and liquid fuels. Um, the other extreme or bookend case is the central low fuel price case where, that had the highest residual fossil fuel emissions. And so that's shown here, in this case, the majority of the captured uh, uh, hydrogen, the vast majority, is sequestered uh, geologically. Um, uh, uh, and so you can see that the, the level of carbon capture is of a, of a similar order of magnitude in these two uh, otherwise very different cases. And then in the, uh, the central case, um, there are roughly even uh, numbers of, of uh, associated with uh, sequestration and with utilization. In terms of the sources, um, uh, this is illustrated in the central case here, uh, the majority of the carbon uh, that's being captured is coming from biomass. Now, I mentioned uh, earlier that, um, that uh, power plants with um, carbon capture are not particularly economic, and that applies to BEX power plants as well as it does to conventional uh, fossil fuel uh, power plants. The utilization rates in a high renewable electricity system are not very high. The place where BEX is occurring in the systems that come out of our optimization is actually in the fuel supply sector. So uh, uh, basically biofuel refineries uh, have very high utilization um, in such a system. And those would be the places where you would apply um, uh, carbon capture um, and, and where you could have sort of integrated uh, utilization uh, and or sequestration um, uh, located potentially in a, uh, in, a, in a complex, in a fuel refining complex, so, so geographically concentrated. Um, and then um, uh, uh, you can also see uh, uh, similar um, sources of carbon in the central low fuel price case. Um, in, in that case, there is some um, um, where the fuel prices are low enough, then you do start to see some economic um, CCS generation. And that's the yellow uh, bar, fairly small bar, um, uh, representing uh, electricity here. All right, so 
Um, fuel production carbon management is illustrated here. We don't have time to go into detail, but it does show that there's actually quite a bit of variety in the fuel strategies that are implied by the constraints that um, I refer to when, when describing the different scenarios. And so um, if you're, uh, it, so if you take a look at, for example, under hydrogen um, in the uh, low land uh, case, uh, then you will see um, that because land is constrained um, for um, solar and wind generation, then the amount of electrolysis, which is uh, uh, basically using that solar and wind generation uh, for its production uh, is lower. And so the lowest amount of hydrogen pr uh, uh, production is occurring where uh, land for renewable siting is constrained. So that's just one uh, example. Um, uh, if you look under um, uh, uh, biomass, then you'll see that um, uh, under the delayed electrification case, um, you have the highest um, uh, production of biomass. So you have a, a, a somewhat counterintuitive uh, result, perhaps, that with uh, delayed electrification, um, uh, maybe it's not counterintuitive, but uh, delayed electrification, you need more fuels. And so that is the case that puts the highest demand on biomass resources and so forth. So these are just some, um, some, um, some uh, quick uh, examples to illustrate um, the effects of, the, of different kinds of constraints and policies on um, fuel production outcomes. Um, but basically, um, at this stage, all we're saying is there are physically plausible outcomes. And from what we know currently, economically plausible outcomes for fuel decarbonization, but it's going to take a while. It's going to take R&D, it's going to take piloting, and it's going to take um, sort of market experimentation and information. Um, uh, fortunately, if we follow the trajectory that I described earlier with uh, doing the things that we know that we have to do over the next decade in terms of decarbonizing electricity and starting a rapid uh, 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 electrification campaign on, on transportation and buildings, there is time potentially to work out the combined fuel and carbon management strategy um, because these are deeply related. In fact, sectoral coupling is extremely important in all cases. So let me come back to the take home messages that I started with. All foreseeable net energy systems in the US will require technological carbon capture, unless uh, somehow there's breakthroughs where we no longer need hydrocarbon fuels and feedstocks for um, you know, everything from um, uh, aviation to, um, uh, to plastics production, uh, or unless the sustainable biomass resource potential is far greater than, um, than, um, than scholars in this area uh, would currently estimate. Second, the types of carbon management required will depend on the fuel strategies employed, uh, and that includes the relative shares of fossil biomass and electricity derived fuels, and whether uh, the use of those fuels is direct or uh, uh, that is whether the carbon that's captured uh, in that process is, is direct. So in other words, uh, highly concentrated sources, for example, a cement plant, as opposed to very diffuse sources where carbon capture uh, is not uh, uh, logical, such as aviation, uh, and where therefore, if you continue to use um, a fossil source uh, for your fuel, then uh, you would need to have some kind of offsetting. Um, and third, the societal force uh, cost of the different forms of carbon management can only be accurately calculated in the context of the whole energy system because the cost of the energy inputs to carbon capture will depend on the electricity mix and the coupling between the fuel and electricity sectors.
Um, okay, uh, last uh, two uh, slides here. Uh, just comment on negative emissions. Negative emissions are uncertain and decline under business as usual. Um, the BAU projection of the land sink is probably that it is declining. Um, and uh, the, uh, the outlook for CO2 uh, capture, transport, and storage uh, is quite uncertain. Uh, and therefore, uh, it is not clear uh, exactly uh, where the BAU uh, uh, carbon management situation is taking us. And, and in order to increase negative emissions is going to require uh, the kind of research and um, development that's being discussed here at this meeting. Uh, and this final slide is that realism about the use of negative emissions should dis extend beyond the current argument, which is largely about moral hazard. So the vacuum left by federal inaction has created a balkanized system of states, cities, and corporation that are pursuing net zero emissions separately, sort of a Russian doll approach where each component of the system separately achieves net zero. This is inefficient. Second, uh, achieving net zero is primarily an infrastructure problem, not an accounting problem. Many negative emission strategies require counterfactuals, that is baselines, which open up the possibility of rent seeking uh, behavior. And finally, uh, this is my main take home message. Negative emission opportunities are themselves physically limited. All scenarios that achieve net zero have at least a two third reduction in gross emissions. You cannot uh, basically uh, direct air capture otherwise uh, 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 offset your way out of very dramatic changes in the energy system. And so from a company standpoint, a business standpoint, they should look to reduce gross emissions first through the pillars of clean electricity, electrification, and efficiency. And also be aware that many negative emissions categories may already be oversubscribed or run the risk of being double counted. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jim. That was excellent. We've got a number of questions for you, only a couple minutes, um, so I'll, I'll pose a couple. Um, the first one is from Atul Arya. Uh, what do you see as the most critical milestones by 2030 for the U.S. to get to net zero by 2050? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. So here's a graphic that was put together by our uh, colleagues at Berkeley Lab. So. Um, these are the uh, what we consider to be the, the key 2030 milestones, increasing solar and wind capacity by a factor of three to four to about 500 gigawatts. Uh, it's about 150 now. Uh, eliminate uh, basically all generation from coal, 1% uh, or less. Maintain the current gas generating capacity for reliability for the reason that I says that doesn't mean continue current gas generation at, at, at current levels. That's, that's a different story, this is capacity. Increase the zero emission vehicle share and the heat pump share of sales to 50% by 2030. Um, that doesn't mean that the stocks are 50%, it means that sales are. Um, uh, that all new buildings and appliances should meet the strictest energy efficiency goals possible, um, that we invest in research and development for carbon capture, sequestration, and carbon neutral fuels. And then finally, we, we start the infrastructure build out uh, for uh, electricity transmission, which is notoriously slow in the United States, and also um, uh, begin to anticipate uh, other kinds of uh, pipeline needs in a decarbonized economy. Great, okay, I'm gonna ask one more question. This is actually a merge of uh, questions that came in from Stephanie Arcosa and Sally Benson. Um, you've mentioned there's gonna be a lot of CO2 utilization compared to sequestration. Um, what will all the CO2 be used for? And is the technology available today and how much does it cost and is it scalable? So this is looking across all of our cases. So, um, uh, the, the point that I made about the carbon capture side was that in some cases there is, the, the captured carbon is primarily geologically sequestered. And in other cases, it's primarily utilized. And you see um, uh, on the bottom row here that represents all of our different scenarios, 
uh, the wide variety that's involved. But if you look at the legend, you can see that the primary utilization use is in power to liquids um, uh, with only a little bit of power to gas uh, from a quantitative standpoint. What that means from a um, sort of uh, industrial infrastructure standpoint is that you have uh, plants probably where there's co-location of fuel production and um, uh, and renewable generation so that you can uh, take advantage of uh, local hydrogen production and also a local carbon source. So um, this is speculative, but it, 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 it strikes uh, our team that um, a future development where you have, say, an offshore wind complex or a sort of desert solar complex where you'd have very high uh, capacity factor renewable generation um, and therefore high utilization um, hydrogen production, if that could also be co-located with the fuel synthesis that takes that hydrogen uh, with a carbon source and produces fuel, that that might be uh, a very uh, economically preferable outcome. It's kind of similar to what happened with electricity uh, uh, deregulation in the late 1980s, where lots of um, uh, uh, gas generating plants were built very close to where electric transmission lines crossed uh, natural gas pipelines. So it's not the same situation, but maybe analogous.